Welcome to the Kings Beat Podcast. I am James Ham, Kings Sider for ESPN 1320 and the Kings Beat. We're, of course, a Blue Wire podcast. Joining me today, Fox 40, Sean Cunningham. Sean, how are you? I'm doing quite terrific. Looking forward to having a few days off for this Thanksgiving holiday. And hopefully we're done with atmospheric rivers because um, I, I don't like them. I, I don't I don't like them very much. <laughs> atmospheric all. rivers. Atmospheric yeah. rivers. And what's the other one? There's something bomb. Yeah. Bomb um, cyclone. A bomb cyclone. There we go. There yeah. we go. Uh, of course, uh, also joining us today is Brendan Nunes from the King's Pulse podcast. Brendan, how are you? I'm good. Usually I'd just let Sean be the weather guy, but it is cold as heck in my room right now. I finally turned the heater on for the first time this year. I'm it's just freezing. It's freezing. No, it's, not even, it's not even that cold of a day. I don't know what you're you're complaining about, Brennan. It was I, colder is, last week. Is that your bedroom? It is my bedroom. Oh, okay. where's this going? No, it's where I, the I magic just... happens, Sean. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I like it. Right. Uh, Sean, you're clearly in your new pad. You don't have everything set up yet. No, I've been I've been pretty busy, but uh, everything is basically in a garage at the moment. So I have some cabinets and bookshelves and just making it work. <laughs> um, all right, let's get into this thing uh, pretty quickly here. Uh, number one, happy holidays to everybody. Uh, we are recording this on Tuesday, a couple of days before Thanksgiving. Happy holidays, happy holidays. Uh, enjoy your Thanksgiving. Drive safe. Be all that. Do all that stuff. Uh, what is the What is the best thing about your both of your families' Thanksgiving? Like, what's the go to dish, and what's the worst dish? Hmm. Brennan, I don't know. I have a pretty white family, so I don't know if we have the greatest cuisine. Um, Jeez, it's pretty pretty fire. simple. I'm pretty simple on my end over here. I. I'm also not a big food guy. I, like, you know, food and movies are not my specialty. I don't what? even have a great answer here. Every time it gets to Thanksgiving, I think we do like, a, yeah, everybody asks, what's your favorite meal? I never have a good answer. I really like mashed potatoes. I really like mac and cheese. And those are very basic and not even necessarily super Thanksgiving specific. Those are pretty basic. Yeah. Pretty, pretty basic, Brennan. Um, yeah. Let's see, I, like my my mom and her sisters and then my mother-in-law, they're they're very good cooks. And my wife is a very good cook, too. Uh, so I, I don't know. I, I think having Thanksgiving, like I always have to have two Thanksgivings, usually one early in the day and the one in the evening. Um, this year, we're moving our second Thanksgiving to Friday. So I have two uh, Thanksgivings, like back to back. Um, and overall, I, I don't know, I like my favorite dish. I, I too love mashed potatoes. Uh, stuffing is always really good. I'm a dark meat guy. Uh, I don't know. My mom makes kolaches, which are, uh, Czechoslovakian and Danish that, um, like I've grown up with. So, uh, that's something that I will have like right when I get there. Uh, I usually bring like a charcuterie board. And so we do like a lot of eating before, uh, Everything starts, the festivities start. Um, but I think my favorite thing about Thanksgiving is sitting around and watching football and trying to ignore uh, loud people in everyone's houses. Do you just isolate yourself into a room by yourself? What are you doing? No, I can zone out in the middle of a giant room filled with people. I just have a, an ability to focus on the TV and and kind of blank out everybody everybody else. Yeah. I just don't understand the people that and I've ranted about this every year. We come across Thanksgiving on our podcast and uh, I just don't understand the people that eat at like two and three o'clock in the, in the afternoon. And and I know you have two Thanksgivings. That's, that's even wild to me. I, I would like choose one dinner and then maybe go have a family gathering at the other person's place. But uh, yeah, that's, that's crazy. Eat at dinner time, po folks, just eat at dinner time. I think everybody likes to like flex their, their Thanksgiving meal. Like, you know what they do so you know mm. that what i do not like i don't like sweet potatoes i don't like Ugh, yams. gross no. i don't like any of that stuff even if they put marshmallows on it that makes it even worse i don't understand that concept at all well you know why they do that to make it sweeter they uh, try to make it taste good because it doesn't <laughs> and and it it's just the it's the dumbest shit ever on in any time they at any thanksgiving meal is when they bring that garbage out uh no not a fan at all Keep okay, are are you Sean? Are you a 
uh, the jelly cranberry like that you have to slice, or are you like an authentic cranberry guy? You know what's funny? We uh, thank you for asking. Uh, we don't actually have a lot. We don't. I never good question. Really good see question. <laughs> cranberry present at uh, at our at our Thanksgiving dinners. Um, not typically do we see cranberry. Now I see cranberry juice, and it gets mixed with you know vodka and all that very often. But I don't really notice the cranberry anywhere um i don't think we have it i think we've had it maybe before but it doesn't bother me I, i'm fine with it uh but it, yeah i don't i don't i i would typically just say i don't think i need that as part of the thanksgiving meal i think all you really need to like if i like the the basics obviously as brennan pointed out the mac and cheese the 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 mashed potatoes and gravy stuffing turkey all that stuff i do like stuff that's a little bit unique uh, so like, you know, we end up having wontons, uh, for uh, made and those are fantastic. Um, but yeah, I mean, get some, uh, do your green bean casseroles or your, uh, well, you know, I'm there. salads like and that. whatever you do. Yeah, it's great. Go for it. I am All pretty right. strong on Turkey being a lot better than ham. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, I'm a, like I'm a pro both. Turkey guy. Yeah. I like both. You know, I've, I've talked about this before we have, um once a year we we do half a pig we get half of a pig um well we get a pig butchered and then we split it with somebody else so we always have a refrigerator a freezer filled with uh with pork um so we always get a ham that's all cured and bacon and sausage and pork chops and all that stuff so it i I don't know i I like uh i like both ham and turkey even though you know it's a it's a big turkey day i don't know I'm okay with both. Yeah, I'm very pro turkey. I don't care how you do it. Just have it. It's got to be present. I've had Thanksgiving meals where there was no turkey, and that's just un American and pisses me off. Oh, no, that's horrible. I can't imagine that. Yeah, uh, and again, dark awful. meat is where it's at. I'm a big dark meat guy. Um, okay, let's uh, let's kick this thing off. Um, sorry if we're uh, going sideways on you and don't I'm not nice kidding. <laughs> no, dumb. It's a free we're, podcast. We're hey, by the way, you, you guys, not to, you know, drag this on. Are you guys, do you guys travel at all during this uh, time of year? Sometimes I'll go just to family in SoCal, but I alternate every year staying here. What a nightmare. So I, I did, I think last year I did the drive or maybe year prior. I did the drive down there uh, in oof. the days leading up and wasn't as bad as I thought, but, you know, definitely a little bit of typical traffic. Okay, so both yeah. my mother and my mother-in-law live in Grass Valley. So we drive up the hill, and we have the the policy of um, we don't travel on Christmas. So we'll travel for Thanksgiving, but we won't travel on Christmas. And we have to break things up this year uh, because my youngest, um, he now works at the clubhouse while he's in school uh, here in the lake, and he got scheduled 10 to 6.30 on Thanksgiving Day. Um which is just like a big bummer. Like we didn't even think of it. Oh, like, ah, uh, you know, there's a possibility. Nope. Didn't even see it coming. Didn't even think that they did Thanksgiving dinner. And sure enough, they do. And he's got to work all day. So that's why we're splitting the days up because it makes it really difficult. And we don't let our boys drive on highway 49 uh, for the first year, their driver's license. Cause it's just treacherous and people die all the time. Um, so so we're like, okay, we're not going to drive all the way back up and get him at 630 and drive all the way back up to Grass Valley and kind of, you know, not get there until like 730 or something. So anyway, nice. yeah. all so right. we don't travel that Highway 49. You, you're all, uh, you stay local, right? You do. Oh, absolutely. There? I'm not going anywhere. No, no, no. Yeah. We're staying, yeah. staying in the greater Sacramento area. Y'all come well, to me. When we had our boys, we told people, if you don't want to come to Christmas, it's fine, but we're not going anywhere. And so, yeah. We, we've done that since uh, Toby was a baby. So we host Christmas and we'll go all out and everything. We, we usually do prime, prime rib for Christmas and everything else, but we're not going to commute. We're not going to travel anywhere. Um, okay, let's get into the ugly because, uh, first of all, if you're watching here on YouTube, uh, please, thumbs up. Uh, subscribe to the channel. I'm sure we're trying to get to 5,000 subscribers uh, by the end of the season. Who knows if that happens or not, but... Uh, you know, tell your friends about the Kings Beat, uh, Kings Beat podcast. Uh, bring them into the family here. Uh, number two, go to the kingsbeat.com, become a premium subscriber, do all that stuff. Um, and uh, the Sacramento Kings are a, uh, well, I mean, for lack of a better term, they're a shit show. Uh, you know, here we are, what are we, 18 games into the season. Um, they've lost four in a row. 
Uh, they have dropped to eight and ten on the year. Um, they don't seem to have a lot of answers, and uh, that doesn't it doesn't even really matter what the quality of team they're playing. Um, I, I think you know we look at the Atlanta loss, the Clippers loss after three days rest, followed by the back to back losses to Brooklyn and OKC. Uh, if the Kings were playing quality basketball, that was a potential for a two and two stretch. And at worst, uh, maybe even a three and one stretch. Uh, I, I didn't see anything worse than that. Uh, but here we sit at uh, at a four game losing streak. Um, where is you guys? Where are you guys at here with the the level of panic for who this team is right now? And uh, you know, what are your sort of thoughts on how they climb out of this thing, uh, Sean? I, I guess we'll start with you. Oh, terrific. Um... <laughs> This is going to sound very much like I'm speaking out of both sides of my face because uh, on one hand, I'm not totally panicked. Um, and I only say that because, you know, a four game losing skids, losing seven of 10 um, can turn around very quickly. Um, but this the, the thing that bothers me the most is this team has gone away from whatever identity that they had to just being a rudderless boat um they don't have that key thing that they can hang their hat on um they it's not just one issue they have so many i i almost feel like you know mike brown monty mcnair and maybe the the core group of this team is like that guy put them all in one and he's just spinning plates and you, you kind of got to run to the other one for it stops spinning run to the other one for it crashes and hits the floor and they've crashed and hit the floor but it's not a, oh, the season's over. Oh, this is so, you know, brink of disaster. They're not going to be, this is just what they are at this point. I, I don't think that is. I think they've, a, a lot can happen in a very short amount of time, but somehow, some way they have to find out who they are, what they are. Um, there were some very telling uh, comments made by people like Malik Monk. Uh, who I've always said is kind of the poster child for what this team is. Uh, he gives them life, energy, vibes, all of that. Um, and you could see it last night in the loss to Oklahoma City. Uh, he they, he absolutely gave them uh, energy, life, ignition. Um, you know, we can dive into that game in here in a second. But um, that loss to me, you know, again, even though they got their head kicked in, not the end of the world, it's the way – large deficits not only try to bring out their sense of urgency, but in last night's case, there's so many things that were small that they let fester and become big. Uh, you know me, guys, I'm not a big gripe on officials. Officiating it was horrendous last night. Horrific. Um, yeah. I, I mean, one of the worst we've seen in probably a long time. Uh, and that's saying something. <laughs> I get it. Um, but I am uh, they they have completely allowed officiating to deteriorate them, get into their heads um, because it's they're just searching for so many answers. They've they're not a bad, bad, bad defensive team, but they are awful around the perimeter. They can't hit their threes, which is still probably the biggest head scratcher. Uh, that exists on this team. So many players that are below 30%. Someone like Keegan Murray, who is just abysmal wide open from the three-point line and just can't hit water if he fell out of a boat. Um, there's a lack of physicality. That's always been there. They're not hitting first. They are just absolutely coasting, trying to think if they can keep it close, get to the fourth quarter and flip a switch. And here comes Fox or here comes DeRozan. And here comes all these things that, that they can rely on. The fluidity in the offense is absolutely missing. Um, free throws continues to be a problem. Um, I mean, my goodness, there's the fourth quarter. The fourth quarter is probably what really bothers me among the most because you've got guys like DeRozan and Fox and Monk three three guys and granted they've been they've been hurt at various points so they're just getting their team back together I recognize that but the fourth quarter should not be a problem and it is you've got guys who look absolutely petrified to shoot the ball uh at times and it's just 
<laughs> you add you couple that with turnovers in the Brooklyn game, and this is just a team that's just got so many things wrong at the moment that they almost need Jesus, religion. I don't know what it is. They need to just go fight someplace. I don't know what it is. I know that they're going to have strong conversations, honest conversations, sometimes re- reflect. They've already made a, 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 a change to the starting rotation with Keon Ellis. Kevin Herter, after, I know, albeit one game, looks like he's absolutely checked out. Um, and I, 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 don't, I, I don't know how you get that back. I mean, get a couple shots to fall maybe, uh, but there's just no confidence there. So uh, good luck, Mike Brown. Good luck to this team. It's not a players-only meeting. They're going to absolutely meet with every, everyone's going to talk. They're going to they're gonna hash it out. Hopefully there is a fist fight or two um, because <laughs> you've already got some more injuries with Trey Lyles going out with a calf strain. This is a very – very crucial time in their season. And I hate to say that because uh, it's not even December, um, but they got to figure some shit out. All right. Well, that's going to do it for this edition of the Kings beat podcast. <laughs> yeah. Sean just blew every topic we had in the span of like 30 seconds. I'm well, sorry. Maybe you know, four I minutes. Let me I go get you Mike that. Brown's dog. So you can punt him. Just... I, 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 did, I didn't want to do that, but it's like, where do you stop? I mean, it, it's, there's just a laundry <laughs> list. And again, very correctable things, guys. Uh, you know, and yeah. I, I, I would hope you all agree with that because I know that. I mean, you look at social media; it's vile right now, and it it's should horrible. be vile. But like these, you how are you this bad? How are you this bad in almost every facet of the game right now? And again, it's not just the four game losing streak, guys. I mean, these are things we're talking about even when they've had a winning record. Um, things just don't look great, and I don't know what that what that is because it's not well you know you're bringing in DeMar DeRozan you got to figure out how to play DeMar DeRozan's been great DeMar DeRozan goes out there he's efficient he's hitting threes he's leading I think he's still leading the team in threes is he not in, ter- in terms of percentage no no Maybe he's not. down Maybe below 30 percent now no he's down yes. below 30 percent okay. as well no it's yeah, Domas and- well it's Keon but uh yeah. yeah yeah it's crazy all right Brendan uh like I don't know how you like shovel through what Sean just threw at you, but what do you got? No, I mean, I think that he's on point. I think the biggest thing there is the lack of an identity currently. And to me, what it was last year, a lot of it revolved around the offensive end um, and the pace, spacing, ball and player movement. And I think that you still see that in the open court after tra- after um, turnovers, but that's the easiest part of the game offensively it's the half court pace and i do think demar plays into that a little bit but also you know what you're getting with demar like you you have to let him play his game like sean said i think he's been pretty effective he was really the one only guy that it felt like was rolling yesterday um domas had an okay start as well but not getting the shooting from keegan murray and kevin herter really hurts And, and it's easier i think to it's more forgivable in Keegan's standpoint. You can look at it and be like, well, he's rebounding so much better this year. He's guarding everybody from Trey Young to Julius Randle, Braun, KD. Um, he's doing a lot of other things. Kevin, not so much. I, I mean, his biggest strength is his shooting and the pace that he provides in the half court. And in that effort level hasn't seemed to quite be there. And he's not the only one. Um, but it's it's putting together 48 minutes, right? We hear Mike Brown say that all the time. We hear everybody else echo the same thing. But in these losses, I mean, you have a 15-point fourth quarter against the Hawks. They actually held them to 20 points, but were only able to put up 15 of their own. And then three days rest, you go play the Clippers. You had 12 points in the first quarter, and then you followed up with 17 in the second. You know, big offensive lull against the Brooklyn Nets, 15 points in the fourth quarter, even though you held them to 20, exact same situation as Atlanta. And then last night against OKC, the offense really slowed down after they put up 64 points on uh, 17 assists in the first half. They only end up with 47 points in the second half on seven assists. So it really feels like, and and there was a 15 to four run. Kings had a one point lead about midway, sort of closer towards the end of the third quarter, 15, four run turns to a 12, 13 point advantage for OKC. And they just never really looked back. Like defensively, we know this team is not a powerhouse. I I think the other aspect is we already knew the weakness of wing forward depth. And I think that's really starting to show its face, but we already sort of knew that reality. And that, that can be a front office thing if if you're going to point to anything in that aspect. Um, But I really think it's losing this offensive identity of this pace and space and, 
And maybe you need to change it up because the reality of DeMar DeRozan being on your team, but you can't have, you can't continue to have these lulls. For me, it really feels like when De'Aaron checks out now, that kind of everything seems to slow down. He's the one that goes out there. And when he was on his crazy offensive run, so much of it was unassisted. It's just going and getting his own bucket or happening to hit the pain and create for others. And I think Malik coming back should help that a little bit, but there's way too many of these extended offensive lulls that are going on for this team. And, and that happened last year. I really thought DeMar would help that coming into this year, but hasn't really been the case. Okay. So I'm going to circle identity as well. I, I think, um, Brennan, you brought up their identity last season. I gotta be honest. This team didn't have an identity at all last season. Their identity was, we we're waiting for the identity to happen the whole season in a lot of the way, same ways that we've waited for, like the San Francisco 49ers to find their identity. And the fact is they never found their identity last season. The, the year before, what's that? You didn't have to bring that up, but it's all right. Yeah. Well, I would say like the year before, um, their identity was very clear. They were an incredible offensive juggernaut. And their identity was even more to that. It was being resilient. So a game like last night, you drop three in a row and everyone in the league thinks you're going to get clubbed by the Oklahoma City Thunder. Everyone believed that they were going to lose that game last night. The identity two years ago was that's the game where you go in and you pound, it's, you beat someone's head in, and, and you win, and you quiet everybody. And that's gone. That resiliency is gone. So that that's the one thing. I'm with you. The identity of this team, like, who, who in the hell are you? Because I, I keep watching, like, it's like three different offenses at once and it, it doesn't make any sense. So that would be my first take. My, my second is, James, what um, if I told you, what if I told you they lost four in a row? What do you mean? He said three in a row. <laughs> I was like, you're right. Three in a row. I was like, is it going to taste a little bit more sour if I told you they lost four in a row? Cause it's actually four in a row. Well, no, but they did lose three in a row coming into last night. So last oh, night was into, four. I, I misunderstood. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. No, no, no. That's I'm what sorry. I mean. Like, uh, no. Last year, when anytime they lost two in a row, they would punk somebody in the third game. Like they, if if you, well, two years ago, if you go back to two years ago when they won 48 games, they lost four games in the uh, to start the season, and they they only lost three twice the rest of the way, and one of them was in the last uh, three games of the season when it it didn't really matter, and they were resting guys. So they were like this resilient group. Now it's like, look at their their stand their um, their game log. It it literally just looks like win loss loss win win loss 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 win. Like it's just erratic and crazy. And there is no momentum. There's no identity. Uh, the other thing is the refs. I think specifically in the last two games. Um, first of all, Mike Brown was fined thirty five thousand dollars today for. Uh, what realistically should have been a, a, at least a one game suspension. Um, it looked like he uh, like chest bumped an official and went off on a guy. And, and I get Mike Brown trying to stand up for his guys. Um, but at the moment that Mike Brown uh, yelled at the official, um, I just thought it was totally misguided. First of all, I don't know whether it was a clean block on Colby Jones or not, but the reason why the Kings were getting their ass kicked had nothing to do with the officials. It had everything to do with the fact that Brooklyn was, what, 13 of 19 from three at that point? Like, it's not an official's fault that your guys don't defend the three-point line at all. So that's number one. Number two, I thought that they were rolling and and in a dogfight, uh, against OKC yesterday. I thought it was a really good game, high quality basketball. The fact that you couldn't hit your three point shots once again, allowed you to not get any separation. So that team kept hitting threes and your team wasn't. So every time that you got through, let's say you get a defensive stop and you score three possessions in a row. The problem is your three possessions in a row that you're scoring are all two point baskets and their two possessions that they they were able to score on were three point shots, and so you're even still. They they had no way to pull away because everyone is hitting three point shots against them, and they can't hit them at all. So then we get to four minutes left in the third quarter, and the officials who were god awful, they were absolutely atrocious. They it got in De'Aaron's head, and then it got in everybody else's head, and from that moment on, they were shot. They got absolutely blown out to end the third quarter. 
I mean, it was a one point. They were leading by one with four, like 419 left in the third and then end up getting railroaded the rest of the game because they let the officials get in their head. And like, look, I, I will be the first to say I don't like to bitch about officials either. There are times where I do bitch about officials, but let's be honest, man. At, at one point in that game, it was 17 to seven personal fouls. I'm not talking about free throws. 17 to seven in the personal foul range. At, like Oklahoma had 17, had uh, had been called for seven personals. The Kings have been called for 17. We even have one of the strangest things I've ever seen, which is where a guy starts bleeding and you review a play to see if somebody should have a flagrant foul. And then you give a personal. There's no giving a personal afterwards. That's not a rule. That doesn't happen in the NBA. I don't even know what the hell they were doing. So I coaching challenge. No. Oh, I mean, they, no, there was no they call. reviewed it. They reviewed it if it was flagrant, uh, right. if it had to be upgraded to a flagrant, but there, I think the scoring table got it wrong. I think there was a call made. I think it also, if there's blood, I think it's also up to the official to look at it. I mean, it might need a little clarification there, but, um, Sean, no, let's I, back up to the Miami game where yeah. Bam well, Adebayo punched Demonis Sabonis in the face and caused him to bleed from the mouth and nose, right. and they didn't look at it to see if it was a flagrant, and they certainly didn't go back and assess a personal. I've never seen a personal. If you call a foul, that's one thing, but Hartenstein starts dribbling away from Sabonis, gets like five, ten feet away, and is bleeding, and so they stop action because there's blood. That's when they replayed it. They did not make a call at that point. So for me, again, where do you get off like going in and, and assessing a foul when you didn't call anything originally? Now, a flagrant is different. If you want to give Domas a flagrant, that's fine. But then I think everybody else who watches Demona Sabonis plays, play goes, okay, well, how many times have you gone back and reviewed a play to see if Dom there should have been a flagrant on, uh, against the player who hit Domas? Because it happens all the time. Bam Adebayo had two two shots to the head uh, on on Sabonis in that Miami Heat game. Not one was called, and not one was reviewed for a flagrant, which is it's supposed to be an automatic flagrant. So so anyway, well, they got to be seen. They have to be seen, you know. And that's a different officiating crew. And but if a guy starts I mean, bleeding out of the face, you, you should go back and look, right? So so anyway, that's my problem. Is that the officiating was so like lopsided one way and then what they do every time. It's so incredibly frustrating. They just start doing ticky tack fouls against Oklahoma city late to even the scoreboard to even the ledger on fouls until it gets to a 22 to 18 advantage, not an a 10 uh, free throw of uh, a 10 foul advantage. So like, look, I I'm with Fox. Just call it straight up. Just call it fair. One it, it, it like, as long as we know how you're calling it, if you're going to call it physical or if you're going to call touch fouls all the time, that's fine. Whatever you're going to do, set the standard early and then call it both ways. Like the breakaway that they stopped when Fox, they claimed that Fox fouled somebody, but to me just looked ridiculous. You have one of the, the leaders in the NBA in steals who looks like he has a clean steal going the other way. They stopped the game like, Oh, that's a personal. And that's when Fox got his tech either way. The Kings were like they're at a point where they're uh, emotionally fragile and they fell apart as soon as that whole situation happened. So that's my second. The last one we might as well kick off here because um, like I agree, Sean, that DeMar DeRozan yesterday was absolutely phenomenal. Um, and I, I think there are plenty of games this season where he's been very good, but I don't know how they coexist uh, because the game before I thought DeMar DeRozan was not good at all. And not only that, but the whole way that that played out, I thought was just like, it was not good basketball. De'Aaron Fox had 24 points in the first half. He shot seven of nine from the field. He gets seven shots in the second half. And the whole start to the third quarter was Domas and DeMar. They went away from De'Aaron completely. And if I'm going to watch a player score 31 points on 16 shots, and then the guy, the other guy scores 18 points on 18 shots and 14 of those shots come in the second half when the, the game isn't like it, it's spiraling and he, most of them are forced. I, like, I don't get it. I don't get it because 
Uh, I, I think DeMar DeRozan is a great player, and but there also has to be realization when a dude is rolling, like feed the hot hand. If if they can't stop De'Aaron Fox, why would you go away from it? And and you could say the same thing about last night's game. The pick and roll with Demona Sabonis and Demar Derozan was incredible. Why did they go away from it? And and I don't know the answer because it feels like the, it's me 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 time. Like everyone's like, oh, they got all the shots in the first half. Now it's my turn. I'm gonna go now. And that's not that's not the way. That's not winning basketball. Yeah, I, I definitely see that. For what it's worth, I think that's one of those things that I could see ironing out over time and being a little bit of a, a growing pain with getting used to DeMar. I mean, I don't think any of these guys are intentionally being selfish out there necessarily, I, I, but it does feel like a your turn, my turn um, style of play that's been going on here. And De'Aaron was totally rolling. And I, I agree with you in that Brooklyn game. It seemed like it was going to be another one of those nights. It, it's a point where I'm like, I think he could flirt with 50 tonight. Like he was, he was rolling and he'd been doing that for the games prior um, and then go away from it. And like you said, same thing sort of last night. So that would be the one thing that I think they, they should be able to look in the mirror and sort of iron that out. And, and we've seen DeMar be willing to, you know, Kobe white going crazy in Chicago, being willing to play second fiddle when he was coming back in deer and had that 109 and in two in, in back to back games, he talked about how he thought he and Domas coming back should just make things easier for De'Aaron and instead it's kind of added some complications so far. Um, but I will say that's, that's the one thing that I would, I would think that the players and coaching staff will be able to iron out and, and get a better feel for just understanding and recognizing someone being in a rhythm and, and trying to ride that hot hand. Sean. Yeah, no, I mean, I don't, I don't disagree with much of that at all. I mean, it's uh, I, I think it's probably the lowest of my concerns because um like, look, a DeRozan moment, uh, officiating last night, even a little bit in the Brooklyn game. To me, it's just a it's a sign of weakness on this Kings team, and it and it goes back to everything I was ranting about to start, which is you're letting the little shit become big because of your inability to maintain an identity and be who you are. Like, I don't think any of us thought that this team was going to be a world beater, but none of us thought that they'd be looking like this through this first, first stretch of, of their schedule. Um, talk about the importance of having to get out to a good start. You've got guys who just look absolutely lost and I can't blame that on officiating. I can't blame that on De DeMar DeRozan fitting into this, to this team. Uh, and I don't blame coaching to be honest. I think there are moments where, where there's been some very, questionable things and you can certainly critique mike brown and, and we will but um th this to me is it, the overarching theme here is you've just got a lot of guys that don't look like themselves they don't look like the players they've been in previous years um again like you rely so heavily on the three demonic bonus said it last night like we're probably not we may not be that team anymore that we need to find other ways to do it and DeMar DeRozan is other ways to do it. So uh, the pick and roll, as you mentioned, James, is other ways to do it. Uh, I think the, the 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 figuring out of, look, this is a green light. Every, there's too many people with green lights. Um, you know, I think this team probably needs a little bit more structure on the offensive end. I think the, the trusting them to be able to go out and do what they have historically done best, um, it, it probably needs a little bit of reexamination because the pace is way down. And if you have De'Aaron Fox on your team, you cannot afford to have pace be very, very far down. So um, there's just a lot of things, guys. And um, like I hear you, I, I will say this too, I, just kind of going back to the officiating thing briefly, like it, a lot of times these these foul calls are uneven because the Kings foul a fuck ton. They, can, they have an inability to defend without fouling. And it happens a lot. And there's look, and, and and I get the whole both ways thing. Um, I, officials don't go out there looking to try and keep things even. They go out there to call a game. Last night's officiating crew, you know, for with the Oklahoma City loss, was about as bad as I've seen in a long time. And you couple that with what you've seen, you know, in the past week, it's it's been bad. But it's not the reason you lost the game. And I think we all know that. Um, it's the it the reason you lost the game is you lost to a better team. But you also have a ton of things wrong, and you are this team is just mentally weak at the moment, and they just have to find out who the fuck they're going to be because 
if if this is the team that they're going to be, they're not going to be very good. This Western Conference is far far too good. And if and if you get to twenty five games and this is what it is, you probably have some really hard decisions to make in terms of what your roster looks like going forward. The other thing I've thought back to a lot recently is when Kevin Herter first got here, he talked a lot about how the ball is power and all this ball movement enabling everybody and and really being energizing. And obviously that's coming from an Atlanta team that runs a lot of pick and roll, does a lot through Trey Young. Um, and this year's Sacramento team feels more similar to that Atlanta team that Kevin was on than these previous Sacramento teams. And, you know, maybe it's the poor three-point shooting, like you mentioned, Sean Domas even getting to the point where like, this might be what we are this year. I think that almost speaks to potentially a loss of trust in some of these other guys, which changes how you play. Um, a lot of their change in offensive during these lulls is, you know, these they love their spray threes, hot word for sure. And that getting to the paint, kicking out to shooters. You lose faith in those shooters. Sometimes you're going to force up some looks because, ah, do I really want to kick to that guy when he's not making anything? And so I, I think that whole ball is power thing that Kevin Herter talked up so much and really felt like a big part of the Sacramento team has died down a bit. Yeah, I mean, he took I, he took two shots coming off the bench in ten minutes last night, and he was unplayable. Like I like I I don't think like Kevin Herter's not the reason why this team is is eight and ten. He he's one of the reasons, but like he's pretty far down the list in, in my mind. Like has he been good? No. Um, especially the three point shot. If, if your game is predicated on you being a three point sniper and you can't shoot the three ball, you got to find other ways to help out. And I think Kevin has done in certain games, he's done. Okay. Um, I, I definitely think Oklahoma last night, they, they were hunting Kevin Herter a bit. Um, but again, he played 10 minutes. So anyone who wants to pin a loss on Kevin Herter right. and that, like, come on now, like he played 10 well, minutes. What's they need they need more like he he's so crucial to especially when the team is awful from from the perimeter that just makes him more important so if he's not there and you can't th th i mean if he's not there and you can't play him more than 10 minutes and again what's this doing for his confidence um with like i've said all the time with him on, if he's on your roster you need him to be kevin hurt you need him to be a guy who is a threat from the perimeter and if he's on your team and he's going over to now he's on the bench and you're only going to play him 10 minutes. What, no, I, you know. I mean, you're, you're not as good as a team like, right. and the depth on this team was already in a huge, it was a huge problem. The The depth is just like, like we'll get to like how we, how we can figure out how to fix this thing, which I don't know how that is, but um, the depth is, is going to be <laughs> a, a part of that discussion. Um, because for me, I like, like, look, I, I think that there are so many things that this team, um, so many issues like like Sean, you brought up. Like, I, I would love to pan a whole bunch of this on on one player. I, I don't think it's one player. Oh, and I, and like you said, Sean, I, man, Mike Brown doesn't shoot one single three pointer. He hasn't shot one three pointer the entire season. Right. And and the fact is, like, straight up, go look at the stats. Dudes are missing wide open threes. So when Mike keeps talking about the spray three and and getting to the middle and collapsing the middle and touching the paint and and kicking it out to somebody for an open shot, they just aren't hitting them. You know, like we had Keon Ellis had this incredible game the other day where he goes for nine threes. Right? He jumped from at that point from like a 30 30 percent three point shooter, maybe less than that, to like okay, now he's over forty three percent. I mean, it can happen that quickly, but I also think like the, the couple of games that DeRozan and Sabonis missed number one, those were the best, absolute best three point shooting games. The Kings have had all season a and the ball moved. There is no ball movement. There is no player movement. This team is uh, like, again, last night where they have 21 assists, 24, assists, 24. They had 17 in the first half when the ball's hopping all over the place. In the second half, they stopped hitting threes. They go one of 13 and they finish with with seven assists in the second half. Like the assist numbers are down, the three point shooting numbers are down, the three point defense defensive numbers are like the worst. Uh, they're 29th now in the league, and and so like we can start circling specific things that are wrong, um, but I don't know how to fix them. And and at this point, like I what is Mike Brown again? I like. I don't want to just sit here and have Mike Brown's back the whole time, but he doesn't shoot threes. And not only that, but 
when he has to run Colby Jones out there for 17 minutes and the guy runs like an 80 offensive rating and a 122 defensive rating and he has to play him 17 minutes that like uh, this isn't a, a swipe at Colby either. Colby's not ready to play 17 minutes at the NBA level. And I don't see that there was another option. Could he have gone small and gone to Jordan McLaughlin against a team that has nothing but giant guards who started Ben Simmons at the point guard position? Are you going to run Jordan McLaughlin out there against a six foot 10 Ben Simmons? I'm not sure that, that there's a place where like Mike has made some egregious error with his, with his rotations. You know, again, Trey Lyles goes down. You got to turn Isaac Jones and like, again, not a swipe at Isaac Jones. The dude was an undrafted player in the draft. He's played a couple of pre a couple of preseason games. He's played a couple of G League games, and you know you've got to count on him against a team that realistically is probably the best team in the Western Conference. Yeah. What? But what I, other option did he have? I wonder too. Like I mean, we we've you talked about things that are concerning for sure. But what do you feel to both of you? Just like what is the biggest overreaction about this team? Um, I don't know. The first take I think of that I see a lot is everybody jump into fire Mike Brown. And to me, like that's just starting all over. Like, I think you need to write it out at very least and give him the opportunity to try to straighten things out. Um, and I, I think it goes beyond him. That's kind of the first thing that comes to my mind there. It's a slippery slope too. you fire mm -hmm. Mike Brown. I, I guarantee you De'Aaron Fox is not going to want to be here for, uh, rebuild number 17 under his uh, in his eight year career. There's no way. Like it, the max money thing is one thing, it's one carrot that you've got to dangle. But at a certain point, uh, De'Aaron Fox has a power agent, power agent that will get him the hell out of Sacramento. I don't think he's doing it again. And you're not and, getting that super max if you don't win games, no matter how good you're playing. No, right. not making all NBA. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, you know, it's sort of a double edged sword here, but um, like if you want to just jettison Mike Brown and do some knee jerk reaction, I mean, you do have to give him some time and I'm not saying he's untouchable, um, but you do have to give him some time to try to figure out what's happening here and try to figure out a solution. And, you know, I, I know he's relied heavily on Luke Laux to do the defensive coordinator job and they are hedging towards the middle because they, you know, they don't have a, a true shot blocker. So they're trying to clamp the middle so teams can't get inline drives. Uh, they're trying to get the deflection, swipe at balls, uh, swipe at, you know, the dribble when, when players are going by and that's shrinking their defense and allowing a lot of these three point shots. But look at De'Aaron Fox recovery. Look at him go out and defend the three point line and how he closes out on a three. He's not having a problem doing it. It, just like everybody else is. And that's going to be Isaac Jones things. had a great close out yesterday. <laughs> yeah. By the way, he, I mean, kind of give it a little bit of positive light here for a second. He might be this year's Keon Ellis. I mean, he's again, we talked about it in preseason and stuff. It's like, it's unfortunate that there's no other guy on the roster that kind of does what he does. But even in the garbage minutes, he goes out there. I mean, he's, he's making an impact. He's having a positive effect on the game. Um, I can envision a world where he gets rotational minutes to believe it or not, at least as, as this, as this roster is currently constituted, because especially if they go away from shooting so many threes, um, you know, having some a presence like him to be able to be active around the hoop is something that could benefit them. No, I agree. It's just like for every moment. And again, I, I I've talked to him a bunch in the locker room. He's a good kid. I think the bouncing back and forth between the G league, getting his confidence up at the G league level, and then releasing him into the wild at the NBA level for, you know, five minute stretches and stuff. I, I think that that's a really, really smart way to bring him along. Right. I actually like what the Kings are doing with their two way and their, and their G league system right now. I really do. I think they're, they're building continuity between the two but they're also giving players confidence. They're giving the ability to go out and have a 22.6 rebound game one night and come back the next day. And like, Hey, we don't need you to be that guy, but we do need you to, to rebound and do that stuff. But you know, we see the great rebound, uh, offensive rebound, and then a turnover. We see him, uh, 
you know, get the ball, like get the, the high post and then try to do something with it. Th- this Isaac Jones I'm talking about. And I just don't think there are certain things he's just not ready to do yet at the NBA level uh, when everyone's bigger, stronger, faster. And so I, I, I'm here for it, um, but you can't walk into a season and you can't get, let's be honest, you can't get 18 games into a season and it's already Isaac Jones time. I mean, no, no, I, I don't mean I that. I'm talking about, I'm talking no. about in, in, in stretches, certainly not a 25 yeah. minutes a game rotational piece, uh, nothing like that. But I, I'm just saying you can see where to have an, to have an impact like that with, with a team that lacks any of that type of, of of energy for a put from a player that big you can kind of see where that might work you know i'm here for it yeah i, I mean i don't mind it in small doses and they look you're gonna have to trey lyles is out and i don't know it doesn't look like orlando robinson or alex len are uh are you know in on mike's like rotation wheel of options here although i think it's gonna be it's probably gonna be situational right like it, you're Minnesota. Going up, yeah, you're going up against a big Minnesota team. I think we'll probably see a little Alex Len. I don't think we'll see Alex Len start <laughs> alongside Sabonis again. Um, but I definitely think, you know, you're going to see some, uh, some variations with Alex, maybe some Orlando just because they are a big team. I'll be honest. I'm a little surprised you haven't seen more Orlando. Um, I thought he played really well in those first couple. Yeah. I, I, I don't know what the reason there is. I mean, it could be a lack of trust could be just whatever, but um, you know, I feel like, I don't know. I just feel like they would have gone to him a little bit more than they've had. Um, But yeah, I mean, it's not, again, much like Isaac Jones, I'm not talking about a 20 minute rotational piece. Um, Well, it's not the difference between you winning and losing. Right. Gotta be honest. Yeah. Like, I mean, this team at, at worst, I think they re- – let's just get to this. We'll, we'll get to the business of basketball. Um, mm-hmm. We're not ready for – Pretty half-assed. No, no. The that was business just... of basketball. You just – sacri- <laughs> Here it is. Look at that. Oh, yeah. You just Sacramento Kings, the business of basketball. Okay, so, so look, I, I know. I Like, <laughs> we have to, like, figure this out, though. Like, I, I, we're not the guys Me? who have to figure it out. <laughs> but like we, what we what we can't do is sit here and and hit a team in the head with a shovel for uh, forty five minutes and then just act like there's no answer. Um, and, and I don't know what the answer is, but get a win. Um, go, yeah, go well, get getting a win. A, getting a win is one thing, but Sean, this team needs bodies. Oh no, I agree. I agree. S- straight up, and and so for me, the first step is the Kings really have to look at the 15th roster spot at this point and see if there's somebody out there on the free agent market that it can at least step in and help. And I don't know who that is. I don't know if, if Jay Crowder would be willing to take uh, a deal to come to Sacramento right now as a, as a guy who might be able to replace Trey Lyles minutes for the next, you know, I don't know how long Trey is going to be out to be honest with you. Uh, This was a calf injury. Um, He had a calf injury during the preseason and cost him five weeks last time. We don't know the severity or anything else, but I'm going to guess that Trey Lyles is going to be out for a while. And, uh, and so the Kings are going to need somebody. And like, I guess let's start there. Is there someone out there that you guys would get like, well, at least you got to give somebody a shot here for the 15th roster spot. Um, whether it's Nasir little, whether it's, you know, again, Jay Crowder, like whoever, uh, what would you guys do it in, in this situation? I don't honestly I don't think any of these are helping you at all not even a little right. bit um I, I think you kind of have to lean back into Alex Len Orlando Robinson really the Trey Lyles minutes we're talking about the backup five I think you go back in that direction a little bit maybe you 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 keep going with Isaac for what it's worth I kind of agree he's the key on of this year but uh it's also telling that we're at the point of of playing Isaac Jones I think it's far too early in his career for him to be somebody you rely on um I, I don't know that anybody on the free agent market is is helping this or even getting consistent minutes. Like you mentioned, Jay Crowder, I think of JTA a little bit um, as a guy with some familiarity with the team, Juan Toscano Anderson that is. But to me, like if, if this roster is actually notably getting better, the two things I'm kind of circling is, is, is Devin Carter going to give you anything this year, which is a huge question mark, but, and also telling that I'm at the point where I'm like, I just need energy from somewhere. And that's the only thing I can think of that could 
eventually provide another spark on this team. Outside of that, it's it's really the trade market. I think that you have to look at it eventually. I mean, t- look, I, I think it's bigger than than what's available in the free agent market. There's people available in the free agent market for a reason. I don't see anyone available in the free agent market that comes in here all of a sudden with no training camp and just solves problems. And, you know, even, even fills in for Trey Lyles, who, let's face it, hasn't been great. Um, I, I think, you know, this is a holy shit idea, but because of just how bad they've been and how often they're look, the Kings kryptonite is a team with length that plays hard. And that's just what is what it is. So, you know what, if that's the case, go small and run the hell out of the ball, just run. And look, you've got a a, a brilliant center in Sabonis who's undersized for the, he's got shorter arms, rebounds like a monster. Um, But you're already giving up so much length to all these teams. You might as well use it to your advantage, run them out of the gym. And okay, but I, but I know how? there's DeMar DeRozan on the team. I know DeMar DeRozan's on the team. But you like just Jordan. lost Trey Lyles, your small ball center. So right. like you've got Jordan McLaughlin. You've got you've got guys that will run. You've got Keon Ellis that will run. Use them. Use them. And, and again, I, I hear a lot, you know, so much with like there's a lot of negative attention on DeRozan for some reason. Not from you, James. I'm even seeing it with fans as as well, you know. ISO ball is part of the NBA. It just is. Look at what Shea Gilgis Alexander did last night. A lot of that comes at the expense. I mean, he ate everybody up. Anybody that tried to defend him outside of the first quarter when they, I thought the Kings defended at a really high level, they actually, you know, created some chaos on the defensive end. It just, the ball just bounced, you know, OKC's way and they make, they make, you look up and you're just like, wow, they're, they're, you're, you're playing balls out defense and this is a tie ball game. You have nothing to show for it. Um, ISO ball is part of the NBA and you can, you can utilize ISO ball, but you can also have a fluid offense at the same time. It is possible to see ball movement at the same time. That can be a figuring out moment. But to me, the only real reason, the only way that they can play to their strengths is by running the ball, going small and you let the chips fall where they may. I think the three point shooting, look, you're just going to have to find easier ways to score. Um, (laughs) <laughs> I you just hope it gets better. I don't know that it will, um, but I'm telling you, Doug McDermott coming in and filling in for Trey Lyles is not the answer. So I, I, I just don't know how you fix all this. Um, I, I think the pace aspect, I would lean into Jordan a little bit more. I know we're talking about replacing right. Trey, and, and I think that you do have to go to some bigs there, but like the Colby Jones minutes to me it, it, that we saw in, previously like give that to Jordan McLaughlin. He's the only guy in my mind, uh, I guess Malik Monk now that he's returned, but Malik Monk, Darren Fox, and Jordan McLaughlin are the three that I think can really dictate the pace of this team. Yeah, and like, look, I think the very specifically, first of all, I think Mike was trying to reward Colby Jones for playing really well in limited minutes on Friday night against the Clippers, and that's why he got minutes against uh, against Brooklyn. But I also think that there was a point in that game where, like, you just knew that the players that they were using, you had to have Colby Jones go out there at six foot four, six foot five and try to defend a a Cam Thomas. Like there wasn't a lot of option there. You know what I mean? You cannot put Jordan McLaughlin on Cam Thomas. You can't put him on Ben Simmons. Uh, Dennis Schroeder didn't play. If Schroeder played, I think you probably would have seen some of Jordan McLaughlin's minutes, uh, you know, Jordan play in some of those minutes. So I didn't have a, a real issue with, Colby Jones was 17 minutes too much. Sure. That was too much. But at at the same time, you know, he gave effort, he gave energy. Um, you know, there were things that he did. It's just like, overall, I I don't know what you do. I I mean, the bench, the bench minutes are so horrible. You got to find something to fortify the bench and, and worst case scenario. I mean, I I think maybe Kevin Herter, if he, if he snaps out of it and finds himself, that could be a role where all of a sudden he's getting more opportunity. Um, and for that matter, I'll even tell you the Brooklyn game, like for as bad as Kevin Herter was for the 10 minutes he played defensively against OKC, I thought he was really good against Brooklyn. Like, remember the stop against Cam uh Cam Johnson. Yep. Um, like there he had the weird play where he moonwalked across, you know, like he was, you know, caught out of position and just tried to stay with the play. Okay, that was one play. Outside of that, I thought he was active. I thought he brought energy. You know, the problem is if you can't shoot, you can't shoot. And uh, the Kings need to figure that side out. For me, like, I I agree with you guys. It is time to hit the trade market. And I don't know how you do it. And I don't want to do some, 
erratic, crazy swing for the fence move, a move just to make a move. Like I've said this for so long. You're making a move if you're this team. You're making a move because you're not good enough. Just flat out. And I don't know that a John Collins or a Kyle Kuzma makes you better. Um, but I certainly know that it can't get much worse than what we've seen so far this year. And no, it can. I, oh no, it can. No, that's <laughs> James, true. James, it can. it can come on. That's that's the this is kind of what I was alluding to. It's like I've seen some holy shit overreactions. Okay. Yeah. For a team that's that's two games under five hundred. Um the NBA changes very quickly. I talk about that all the time. You get a win or two, it cures a lot of ills. But again, this is there are we've identified those bigger problems that they've had that have plagued the team since the beginning of the season. It's not they're just getting magnified during a four game losing streak mm-hmm. and even a time where you've lost seven of ten. The, it, they have to make adjustments because um, you. you Either they're like I asked Damas Sabonis this last night, and I even set him up by saying, "Is this a is this team still together, or do you find that out maybe after the strong conversations that you guys might be having in Minnesota?" And he says, "No, we love each other. It seems very good." And and I think that's part of the problem. You know, what did Dave Yeager say? You got a team full of nice guys. Yeah. You know, you don't have. And again, that goes back to I know De'Aaron Fox has been here a long time, but this team ends up being too nice. And that's why I'm saying go fight, <laughs> you know, and I'm saying that proverbial it just go out there and you have to show your teeth. You have to call some things out and you have to hold people accountable. And that's kind of what's happened with Kevin Herter. The trouble is you can't have a sulking player that all of a sudden just completely loses themselves either. So um, I don't know that you're at that at that point yet. I know with Kevin, when I'm using Kevin as an example, that was a one game thing. It's the first time he's coming off the bench might be a little bit of an adjustment, but um, it's not like that guy wakes up and goes, "Oh fuck it, I'm I'm going out here just to you know go through the motions, get me out of here." Uh, I'll, he could be at that stage. I don't think he's at that stage, but I think it's just a total end of frustration uh, across the board. And you may all love each other, but I don't think you're as together as you think you are. No, I agree. Um, okay, so is there a trade that you guys would like <laughs> contemplate right now? Like, where are we at? Let's go. Let's go I, trade machine, trade machine geniuses. You might need well, to give me till next to episode to lay out a bunch of names, but I mean, the Brooklyn guys come to mind. We just saw them. I, I think Dorian Finney Smith, obviously kind of on the sideline right now, but Cam Johnson is some size, you know, Bobby Portis is going to be a name that a lot of people like. It's I don't think, I don't think Milwaukee's given them up because I, I wouldn't back. think so either. Yeah. Um, the, I mean, the Brooklyn guys are who stand out to me. I think the Kuzma conversation could be revisited. He hasn't been very good this year. Um, but I mean, I think you're going to end up hearing some of the same names that we heard recently. Sean. I, I mean, look, swinging I, for the fences with Brandon Ingram. Going to go usually, get that Brandon Ingram deal. Usually you hear these names and nothing comes of it. We've seen it. Um, there's, it, it's, it's the ones you're not hearing. Um, and I just think it's too early. You don't have look. It takes two to tango. You can identify who you want. You can identify trade scenarios and packages you might throw. You need that other team to go. Oh yeah, I'm willing to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, and because of that, especially because it's early, I don't see a team out there that's desperate. And Sacramento right now, if they were doing that, would be doing so out of desperation. Yeah, Maybe it should they be desperate? Like- the only thing I can think of is like Brooklyn or Utah, like wanting to well, Utah's four and 12, I guess, but like Brooklyn outperforming expectations. And maybe they want to be more in the capture the flag race. Hmm. That's interesting. You mean take a step backwards because they're, they're winning too much. Right. Yeah. Like I, I think the problem is that if you look at the Eastern conference, well, let's just look at the West. There's only three really bad teams that are all below the Kings. Um, but that's it that, you know, there's only three <laughs> bad teams and that's it. No, I, I, but then you look at the Eastern conference and two of the teams at the bottom are not going to be at the bottom at the end of the season, most likely, uh, in Philadelphia. And, uh, well, we've already seen, uh, Milwaukee sort of climb back up. Um, but like, who is, who is trading right now? Who is saying, oh, we're, we're out of it. And we want to, we want to be bad because I don't think Toronto is is a team that's like 
oh no, we're giving everything up right now. They never do. They're always looking to build. I mean, again, if you can get Robert Williams out of Portland, uh, maybe that makes some sense. But now that team is is literally one game behind you in the standings. Um, the Pelicans, you know, maybe you could, you know, rummage through like their their junk pile and see what makes sense for you. But again, they're just junk now getting pile. healthy, and they might maybe like, hey, we want to give this thing a run and see what it looks like. Um, yeah, it's it's tough times, man. I, I don't know. You know, again, December 15th is that first day that you can trade players that you acquired during the offseason or that you signed during the offseason. So, um, but I, I don't even know that like a team like the Kings should be waiting until December 15th. By the time you get to December 15th, then, you know, things could be really ugly, uh, especially with your lack of depth. And so if I'm the Kings, I'm, I'm actively pursuing things right now and seeing what I can come up with, especially if you're going to pull Kevin Herter out of the starting lineup. So, yeah. well, and, and, and again, I mean, you talked about teams that I mean, are, are you doing so out of desperation? Do you think the Kings need to be desperate at this point and go and do some type of move that way? I mean, they, I, to me, I don't think you, they have enough, they have, they've had enough games yet. I don't think that they're in that position yet. Um, this is very solvable on their end. You clearly know what they need. You know clearly that but they've needed almost the same thing for a couple of years. They just addressed a huge need in the offseason with DeMar DeRozan. Um, you know, the 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 luster and the shine isn't off that diamond quite yet. I still have very high uh, expectations for this team and what they can do offensively, but um they they have a roster imbalance, and that's that's for that's for sure, and it's showing that way. But going out there and making some crazy move uh and maybe overvaluing something that may not over you know help you with that much in the long run that's that's what i think is the fear there and i think everyone's gonna look at around the league everyone's gonna look at monty mcnair and say you're doing this out of desperation and i'm gonna bend you over a barrel yeah yeah i mean just look at utah look at look at danny ainge look at what danny ainge does in utah um did it in boston i mean this this is he's not just going to give talent away I'm yeah. not touching John Collins here. Go ahead, Brendan. They're one of the teams I, I think that like makes sense if you're trying to say like who currently would be sellers though. And I, I get the whole Danny Ainge situation and I, I think he's smart for what he does for what it's worth, but their own pick is top 10 protected this year. They're already in a spot where it looks like they're going to be there. Um, but you know, they don't, might want to not mess it up and go on a run and they're only four and 12. Um, it's still early, but they only have their own pick one to 10 protected. Like that's the sort of situation I would think that maybe a team could be willing to to sell at this point, but um, to Sean's point, I mean, they're going to know where you're coming from as well, and that's a tough spot to be in. It's no, like I, even I was I looking. Agree. You mentioned Brandon Ingram a minute ago. I mean, look at the Pelicans in general. I mean, they've just been depleted. Their roster is absolutely gutted with injuries. Um, haven't obviously gotten off to the to the start that they would have hoped to have gotten out to, and mainly is because of injuries. And they're dead last. <laughs> Man. They picked Alfred Payton up off the street and started him the same day. And just so people know, Alfred Payton did not play in the last two seasons in the NBA. He's 30 years old. He had not played a minute in two years. (laughs) And you know who he started next to? Brandon Boston, who had been waived at the end of training camp. And they claimed off waivers because they needed depth. That's he. It was Brandon Boston, Alfred Payton, and then Alfred Payton goes out and has twenty-one assists. Like what in the world? I, like I, I don't know what to make of this team. I, I don't know how to, like I, I don't think there is like a, an instant fix. But I also look at the roster and just go, look, you can't walk into a season with, with one player you know is going to be out for six months, uh, one open roster spot, and then you know, a bunch of young guys. Well, even a Colby Jones, let's just throw a Colby Jones and a guy like Doug McDermott that you signed again off the street. I mean, you walked into the season with realistically nine or 10 players on this roster, Orlando Robinson. We can throw in that mix. I, I think we're down to nine at this point. And that's, it's just really tough because when bad things happen and you lose three players for a week, all of a sudden you're totally screwed. And then even when you're getting them back and, you're still trying to figure things out. This team, even when they're a hundred percent healthy, still has a lack of depth at the, at the wing. And so like, I, I don't know, like I, I like the idea of Isaac Jones. I like the idea of Isaac Jones two years from now, not today. And that's, 
it's not a dig on him. It, he needs to learn how to play the game of basketball. I mean, as a guy that literally walked onto a junior college because his friend was told, Hey, if you can make the team, if you go find someone who's six foot eight and he went out and found Isaac who hadn't been playing for a year. So, Hey, you want to come play with me? Okay. And next thing you know, he's in the NBA a couple of years later. Like it's a great story, but we have to be realistic about, you know, like finding moments for him to be successful as a player. And that's going to be really difficult until you get a whole bunch more minutes under his belt at the G league level, at the pro level. Um, so expecting him to come in and save the day, 18 games into a season. That's no, a little, God, that's no, a little that's unfair. Not, no. and, and don't, I hope you're not insinuating. That's what I was saying. I'm not saying. No, 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 no. Yeah. But what I'm saying is he's one of like, like he has no, he, a whole group he, he, of players that can't again, really play. They can't help yeah, you guys. He's, he's only a, uh, someone you might even look at because there's nobody that does what he does on the roster. Of course. The, the reality is you need three of him on a good team. <laughs> no, the reality is Sean, here's a, the reality. You need another Keegan Murray. That's it. Mm, like I don't know. You need a better Keegan Murray. You need a guy who does more th- rebounds consistently, block shots, rim protects. You're like Keegan Murray, in theory, he's fine. You, you need you need another guy. Or you need another big on the team that is better than what you currently have. Yeah, but I mean the level of player. You need another level of player of Keegan Murray. And and, and again, Keegan's averaging eight point two rebounds per game. Like I, I I'm not. He he's not shooting the ball well, but if he was, right. he'd be averaging 16 points a game. Like it's it's not hard to see how his season could turn around very quickly. But if you don't find another Keegan Murray to take some of the pressure off your current Keegan Murray, like the dude's running out there and playing, you know, 40 minutes of of really good defense every game, and then oh yeah, we need you to rebound, and oh yeah, we need you to hit threes, and like there's there's a lot to it. I think actually Keon Ellis in the starting lineup, it's probably going to help Keon, uh, Keegan Murray the, the most. So take some of that stress off him from having to chase guards every single night. But I, don't, but I still think that that role exists for him though. I, you know, whether Keon starts or not, I think they're still going to be asking Keegan Murray to do the very same thing. And I don't think that changes just because Keon Ellis is in the lineup. It's just because again, he's playing more with Keon Ellis in the, in the, rotational game it's just even him and the starter it's like no it's still going to be the same thing well yeah but what i'm talking about is is tomorrow night they play the minnesota timberwolves and keon ellis is going to start on anthony edwards and and that means that keegan murray is going to have to defend julius randall uh for long stretches but that's a lot easier than keegan murray having to defend uh trey you know or anthony edwards and who knows who is going to defend? Like you don't have an answer whether it's Mar Rosen. Rosen, yeah, yeah, yeah. Whether it's Rosen or it's Domas, who's going to defend Julius Randle? At least you have this. The answer is nobody. The well, answer is no. nobody. Well, no, like fully, <laughs> the like answer is nobody. Yeah, yeah but yeah. but the I would rather have Keon Ellis <laughs> and Keegan Murray in the same starting lineup, where at least like they can try to defend these guys as opposed to King and Murray and Kevin Herter, where it's like, okay, who's what are we going to put Kevin on, on Rudy Gobert and just say, Hey, keep him away from the basket while Domas and Damar chase these other guys. Like it, it's tough. Yeah. Uh, last question for you guys uh, before we get off or we're, we're uh, running late on time. Um, this is something that popped up yesterday and and it's something that Mike Brown bought up, brought up. I also heard it from someone else within the walls of, of the organization, but uh, first half uh, defensive rating is not good. Second half defensive rating is excellent. And this team is like a top eight team in the second half. And in the, in the first half, they're like 29th in defensive rating. Uh, where are you guys at with this idea? It shows that they don't play a full 48 minutes and that's basically it. That's, that's as far as I go with it. Um, no, you know, it, it, it shows that in a lot of these games, they're having to dig themselves out of holes and the sense of urgency escalates. Uh, but again, to me, it just overwhelmingly just shows that they're not a complete 48 minute team. Sense of urgency. That's the word right. I'm in the circle. Yeah. Like For where's sure. the sense of urgency from tip? Go ahead, Brennan. 
Yeah, going into yesterday's game, so this doesn't include the OKC game, it was a 115.7 uh, defensive rating, 25th in that first half, and second half defensive rating, 108.5. That's sixth in the league there. Um, it doesn't make much sense to me. I think what Sean said is really all you can point to because typically the – you know, these guys are playing really heavy minutes, them being the the main four or five guys. And so you would think that like second half is when you would start to trail off as you're as you're playing, dealing with a little bit of a heavier load. But it, it's been the inverse. And I, I did think in that OKC game for what it's worth, because it was it was slow starts in the previous two Brooklyn, um, 28 points. You gave up 37, the 12 point quarter that they had in the first against the Clippers. They, they came out and had a good start against the Thunder. It just inversed you know, that all of a sudden the second half was the issue. Um, so I agree. I think it's putting together a full 48. It's that sense of urgency and, and looking in the mirror and realizing like, all right, we have this issue. One of the main three, four guys needs to take control of those moments. Okay. Um, I guess the, the follow-up question then is who's to blame. I don't think it matters. I think they're all to blame. I mean, it's, it it's all falls on this collection of guys. The guys are out on the court. They're not executing, and it comes down to execution when you uh, have these these issues that you do. I don't think this is a coaching issue. I think certainly coaching factors into it. Don't give me don't mistake, but it comes down to an absolute execution uh, uh, scenario with this roster, and so it's on the collective. There's there's no one to blame, or everyone I, to blame. I will say I think the biggest piece of the blame pie for me is is just the shooting, and that goes to Kevin Herter and Keegan Murray. And like I said earlier, I think Keegan's is more excusable with everything that he's doing, but those guys have to shoot. You can't live with Kevin Herter shooting 28% and Keegan Murray shooting 29%. Like I, I just don't think that that's going to work, and I think that we're seeing the trickle down of potentially not trusting those guys. So now the main creators are forcing up shots, and I, I think that you have to be – able to make those threes. Okay. Uh, Brennan, you did run uh, up the sequence the other day. Mike Brown talked about it, that they literally had a play design uh, two games in a row for the first play of the game. They scripted the first play of the game and the team just completely bungled it. And, and to me, it's like the focus, like, like if you're going to have a game plan, number one, you got to follow the game plan before you start saying the game plan's not good. Uh, number two, you have to execute and like if the coach the coaching staff has a specific play for you to open the game on the offensive end and if you're yelling at guys to like go get in the right position on the opening possession what does that say about what's happening like there's a disconnect here and, and again i don't i don't think that's a coaching issue as much as it is there's something that's being left like when the players go out on the court from the moment, and we've seen this time and time again with this team, you know, they get to the second half and someone stuck their foot up their ass in the, during halftime and yelled at them and they come out and they play better. Like, where is that from, op from the opening tip? And I, I don't know what the answer is. I don't, I don't know why this team comes out lackadaisical and does some, something like not do the basics on the first play of the game. So I think having a lot of self-belief is a very big thing in the NBA and you see it with some of these shooters specifically, but in general, like that first beam team season, I, I think they genuinely thought they could beat anybody on any given night. And I, I think that still exists, but you know, if, if questions are lingering, even internally, I think that that starts to show and I don't know, but at the point where like have to start guessing about some of that stuff, because it doesn't make sense. Some of these lulls. Yeah. Y'all feel um, better. I feel yeah. great, John. It's warmer in here now. Heater's working. I'm good. It's a counseling session. I get to go just, freeze my I, ass off for the next uh, couple of hours out on a soccer field. Um, while the oh, boys... boo hoo! It's not going to rain. Do you know what I had to go through last <laughs> well, Friday be, night? It's going to be freezing, Sean. <laughs> Sir, in Stockton, just getting absolutely pissed on. Uh, just, oh, it was. I was. I was actually fortunate. I, I had good rain gear. Didn't get to, you know a, a sock full of water did all right but all right. to you i flaked on that one because of the weather oh it is it, it can be fun but when it's when it's like cold in that like i i'm a, i just get miserable so Hi, high school uh, no more no more atmospheric rivers although high school football is kind of nearing its uh 
it's finale coming up. We got section championships this Friday, Saturday out at uh, SAC uh, City College, Hughes Stadium. You should go check them out. There's actually like you got Grant and Rockland, the winner of that game last year, went to state. So it's a rematch in the section as opposed to being in the NorCal Bowl like last year. And then you got Oak Ridge and Folsom. And, you know, that's always it's always a rivalry, even though it's been a one sided rivalry. Uh, Oak Ridge always kind of gives them a test um, this late in the season. So they get to play each other for the second time. Mm, Folsom is good, man. Real good. All right. Let's uh, let's get to final thoughts. What do you guys got? Uh, Brendan, what do you got? Final thoughts? I would say that kind of just echo what Sean said earlier. I think the NBA changes really fast. I thought the Kings had a chance. It, it just felt very Kings. Like you kind of mentioned James to potentially win that game against OKC yesterday. And obviously it went the way it did, but things would feel so differently right now. You, you have an opportunity here. Minnesota has been struggling. And I think having a similar, I guess, identity crisis, you could call it, you got Portland afterwards. I think that things can change quickly and you can get some positive momentum um, and I, I think that can be a little bit infectious on a roster. So, you know, they're far from from buried or anything like that. Um, but it, it can change quick. I think they need to start hitting shots and and sort of figure out a little bit more togetherness. And also shout out Harrison Barnes getting player of the week. I, I think it was Harrison a little, a little Barnes. Wild that he got that. Um, but he's been playing great. So credit to him. First he's ever? Was it his first ever? It was. First ever Western Conference yeah. Player of the Week. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my final thought, I was just, I was putting myself, I asked you guys if you felt better because I was putting myself in the, in kind of the, the, the body of a Kings fan listening to this podcast and they probably want to go slit their wrists and jump off a bridge or whatever it is. Uh, I, I, I don't feel much like Brennan talked about, like what I said in terms of how quickly things change, they do. Um, and look, we've seen imperfect teams win, win, rack up regular season wins. I think, you know, you go back to, the Dave Yeager year when they, when they flirted with 40 wins and uh, um, people were kind of feeling pretty good about that team for a little while. They were in a kind of contention. Granted, it wasn't the, you know, third place finish that the Kings had just a couple of years ago, but um, that was an imperfect team. Uh, there are imperfect teams that, that do well. They can find themselves and kind of start leaning more on what, where they're where they find success and being more true to themselves and yeah you've got flaws but you hide those flaws with smoke and mirrors and accentuating the positives and accentuating what you do well and this team doesn't do that very well uh they didn't really do it as james pointed out they didn't really do that very well last year either um so somehow they have to in a very crowded western conference keep their head above water uh but i feel like Fan support has been phenomenal. It's it's unfortunate this team hasn't played well on their on their home floor. Uh, so I get the frustrations for sure. But not even December yet. Uh, I I don't know when we stop saying it gets it's too early. But um, probably right around twenty five games is where that panic button exists. Hmm. That's seven games from now. Yeah. It's um. Close. Yeah. I think my uh my final thought is like take a step back before, before anything rash happens here, take a step back and look at, uh, be honest with yourself about what something like firing a coach would do to this franchise or what, uh, you know, trading player X would mean for the franchise. Like this is not a knee jerk reaction moment. It's a moment where clearly you've got some issues and you got to figure some stuff out. I think this team needs to be added to, not subtracted to. But I also, like, I just have this nightmare scenario playing out in my head again and again and again of uh, what firing a head coach might mean for De'Aaron Fox in the future with this team and whether he would want to be part of something like this uh, going forward. And I don't know the answer for sure. But everything he said during preseason, everything he said to during the an interview with the athletic, all of it leads me to believe that a lack of stability at this moment is is not what this team needs. They need stability. They need to ride out the storm, figure it out as a group, and then move forward. And that doesn't mean that Mike Brown keeps his job forever if he doesn't figure out ways to turn this thing around. But this thing is like there's a danger here of this thing spinning out completely and like dramatic, horrible things happening where 
we're all looking at this is that moment where you drop back to you know 2005 2002 to uh, not 2005 to the 2012 2015 2017 2019 where it was just shit and you had no talent and you're praying that somehow you could win 28 games and uh like it's right there just this is not the time to hit a panic button and do something stupid because it's like that's it's there's <laughs> there's murmurs here that you don't it's, you don't combat stupid with stupid yeah, the stupid can, things can, could happen very quickly. Can you guys think of an instance where an interim head coach turned things around? In I can Sacramento? tell you, I covered nine Indy head wide. coaches in my first 12 years. And, I mean, look at Boston. Yeah. I guess that was interim. That Yeah, you kept the whole staff, though, you know, except the one. That, but that, but yeah, that's what right. interim you're usually right. means. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. That's a good point. We are talking about one. Okay, there's one. Sean, can you name a second time? <laughs> an interim head coach? Oh, I'm sure I can. I mean, look, it's it's there's nothing there's nothing that Rex Hughes, least, Eddie Jordan, it, Jerry Reynolds, Kenny Nat, uh, Ty Corbin, George Carl, well, Alvin Gentry. George, George okay, Carl there's seven. There's seven. Yeah. What do you got? Go ahead. Uh, no, not in Sacramento. In, in Sacramento, no. I think. I think. Look, this is not a. To to, the, to me, this is that you can be critical of coaching, but this is not a get rid of your coach after you've just extended him. Um, th th that's that's rather silly. In fact, I'd even argue the conversation that might be louder in the room. And I'm look. I'm not saying that this is. I'm not saying that this is the case. But if 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 I ruled the world, if this was my organization. I would look at the conversation of can you win with Fox and Sabonis being louder than the conversation of do I need to fire Mike Brown? Or and front office, like the surrounding pieces. Or we talked about the depth on this team. Sure. Um, but again, like I, I don't think either of those conversations need to be had. I think this is a, again, you take it for what it is. Um, this is a team that has some imbalance. Even if this season goes, I don't think this season is going to go horribly wrong. And I think people have different definitions of what horribly wrong mean, but let's pretend this team is in the play in tournament and they lose and they miss out on the playoffs. Uh, I, I think some would consider that horribly wrong. I don't know that I'm making any grand, huge changes at that point. Um, I think you just continue to try to build on what you have. You go into the summer with a healthy Devin Carter, who's your first round pick. You you you're all in on him. There's a reason you you drafted him, and then you still continue to try to build around what you have. I think you, you get to if you have the same problem next year, then that's when things become problematic, and you look at that reset button. But uh, I think you're a long way from that. There we go. All right. Uh, that's going to do it for this edition of the King's Beat Podcast. If you're still watching and you don't mind, give us a thumbs up. Uh, give us a rating review wherever you listen to your podcasts. Uh, subscribe to the channel wherever you listen or watch your podcast, whether it's YouTube or anywhere else. Uh, we will have a sponsor starting next week. What? A new, a new sponsor for the team. We're not going to release oh. that yet, but we will have a new sponsor for the team. I mean, for the for the for the, uh, the Kings Beat podcast. <laughs> for all of us, we'll all have electronic uh, license yeah. plates. There it is. Uh, we're not doing electronic license plates. Uh, but we uh, we will have a sponsor next week. So um, I don't know. Everybody uh, have a good Thanksgiving. A happy holidays, to everybody. Uh, be safe. Uh, it's don't talk politics. Don't oh, talk politics at Thanksgiving. Funny. Thank you, Jesus. That's a good one. <laughs> Love your neighbor. Put your uh, arm if around him. Wants to talk politics? Feel free to <laughs> smack him in the head with a drumstick or throw mashed potatoes in their face. Uh, I give you that. I give you that uh, leeway. Someone wants to talk politics and they won't stop. That's when it happens. That's um, your family. Give them a hug. Yeah. No. Oh, we'll see how it goes. <laughs> <laughs> give, that, give that big idiot uncle a hug and tell him, and just, no, oh, we love you. Let's talk sports. Just, just pivot real quick. Hey, did you see this movie? Those are the moments where I just turn the volume up and I just keep going and going and going. And then everyone's like, why is this so loud? It's like, because I want him to shut up. There it is. Uh, awesome. Good point there, Sean. Um, yeah. All right, that's going to do it for, for this edition of the Kingsbeat Podcast for Box 40, Sean Cunningham, 
and Brendan Nunes from the King's Pulse podcast. I'm James. Oh, Hampton, he wore it. 1320 the King's Beat. We'll see you very soon.